Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts in the first chapter, verses 15 through 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 people and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their language Hakaldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let this homestead become desolate and let there be no one to live in it, and let another take his position of overseer. So one of the men who have accompanied us throughout the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who also was known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Well, there you have it. (laughs) The first meeting minutes from the first ever church business meeting. Here at the beginning of the book of Acts, even before the official establishment of the church at Pentecost, the disciples are all gathered in a room in Jerusalem to handle a few important ecclesiastical matters. Ecclesiastical is a fancy word for church. You see, Jesus has died and been resurrected and has just flown up to heaven. And so they're standing there and they're thinking, now what? And what do they do? They call a church meeting. They call a church meeting because there is a desperate need for organization. They're down by one after the death of Judas, and they need to identify the 13th disciple. Such an ordinary call, this call of the 13th disciple, but done with an expediency the church has never seen since. (laughs) Amazingly, Matthias is nominated, endorsed, approved, and called all in one meeting. So the story goes that there were two candidates nominated from the floor. The first one was Joseph, also known as Barsabbas or Justice. Three names, so you really know who wasn't called, and Matthias. Peter thought it appropriate to pray to invoke a divine blessing on the proceedings. And here we find the words of his brief prayer where Peter calls upon the Lord, calling God in Greek, this glorious word, the cardio nosta. Cardio meaning heart, nosta meaning knower, no, nosta, Gnostic knowledge, heart knower. Have you ever prayed to God as the heart knower? Mm, give it a try. He says, Lord, you know our hearts. Show us which one of these you have chosen. Not will choose, not do choose, have chosen. Peter prays, trusting the Lord's wisdom in the handling of this very human matter. Well, after praying, lots were cast. Among first century Jews, that would have seemed the most natural method for settling the issue. All of the offices and duties of the temple were determined by the casting of lots. Do you know what that is? Okay, well, if you don't, I'm going to tell you. The names of candidates were written on stones, 
And they were placed in a vessel, and this vessel was shaken until one of the stones fell out. And so with essentially the flip of a coin, Matthias was appointed to round out the twelve. And that's how it happened. I don't know, should we just make that recommendation to our nominating committee? We'll just put everyone's names in a vessel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I'm going to get that as an amen. We'll just put it, right, this is how we're going to do it from now on. We're just going to put everybody's name in a vessel, and we'll just, whoever's name falls out, we'll assign to different jobs. (laughs) I hope to have a job tomorrow. So in this very ordinary, very humanly organized way, there is no heart-pounding excitement for this call, no Cecil B. DeMille moment like the god of usual dramatic style here for Matthias. There's no burning bush, no visits from angels like for Mary, no blinding flash of light on the road to Damascus like for Paul. So it makes me wonder, why bother telling the details at all about this 13th disciple, the vacancy filler, the add-on that never gets mentioned again. Chances are, when you hit something like that in the Bible, the finger's meant to point to us, the readers. And so let's start here. Perhaps we ought to look at the qualifications of the disciples, determine how they determined Matthias ought to have ought to have in order to warrant his consideration for such a noble and honored appointment. What gifts? skills, educational pedigree, and experiences are necessary to be the successor to Judas. What do you think? Well, Peter says, for the first qualification, that it must be someone who has, quote, accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. In other words, the first important qualification for this call is time. Time spent in the company of the disciples learning side by side at the feet of the master. Someone who spent time in this community of believers. However, (laughs) for any other qualifications, it could be argued that Jesus had pretty low standards for his chosen 12. And time spent with them might not be all that it was cracked up to be. For instance, consider Matthew the tax collector, a man who gouged people for money, the moral equivalent of a thief. Or James and John, brothers fighting to sit at the place of honor at Jesus' right hand when he's strung up on high. They are nowhere, and when he is strung up on high, they are nowhere to be found. Or Peter, the inheritor of the keys of the kingdom, bugging Jesus with details like where he will eat or where is he going to sleep. He brags that he, unlike his colleagues, would never betray Jesus, but does so not once, but three times. Thomas doubts, and Judas sells him out for 30 coins. One might argue that spending time with these 12 would not be all that much of a good thing for the ministry of Jesus Christ. But such an argument would miss the point entirely, would it not? There is something in the story about how ordinary occasions, like church meetings, are sacred and special in spite of and because of our humanity. And so it begins with ordinary people. We have somehow glorified, idolized, fantasized the people of the Bible as if they were religious superstars, haven't we? Red carpet kind of folk. People we would watch on TV but never, ever meet in person. Except that every story in the Bible makes an effort to point out just how ordinary the people were whom God called. William Bausch contends that these ordinary people had the talents Jesus needed, which was exactly none, so that they would never think it was their enterprise instead of his. No one, after seeing the apostolic dirty dozen, could claim he or she was not worthy of the call. 
No one can claim exemption from being a disciple no matter what their background. No one is exempt from service. And the thing is, the call of God isn't always a glamorous one that lands our pictures in the paper. No, we're left with a one foot in front of the other kind of call in life that comes to us day to day in the form of a friend in need of prayer and comfort, and the neighbor who lost his job and is struggling to feed his three kids, and the friend just diagnosed with cancer who needs a pillow to pound and a shoulder to cry on. And yes, even in the telephone call from a church friend simply asking for your help to draw you into the work of Christ being done in the church that you care about. For all the commonplace qualities of this story, we are perhaps tempted to ask in the first place, but why, why bother filling the vacancy at all? Don't you think 11 were enough? Do you think it was important to replace Judas? The early church did, but why? Peter defines the need to add to the 11 this way. He says, quote, Someone must become a witness with us. Right from the start, it becomes clear that the work of God is, some, is not something that can be done alone. Not just a few respected leaders, not just the pastor, the book of Acts makes it very clear that the will of God cannot be done alone in a vacuum or a vigilante style. It takes a whole bunch of people working together. It takes a community. It takes a village. It takes a church. I think one of the current challenges of the 21st century church and now in the wake of a pandemic that forced us apart is our need to reclaim our church communities as a priority. The Christian faith, you see, is a communal faith, not an individual one. When what happens to me becomes more important than what happens to us, such a constant focus on the individual weakens the community as a whole, and it threatens the church. There is, you see, an accountability in community. And just as you can't separate belief from your experiences, you can't separate the practice of your faith from your relationship to the church that you belong to. Attending worship, sitting at a table in conversation, praying together, it matters that we are together and that we know that we are better together, that we can fill this agenda and make a difference when we are together not when we are apart. Somehow, as people come, become more and more isolated, so much so that do you realize a Surgeon General just recently called loneliness a critical health crisis? We need to reclaim the idea that it matters that we are a church and not simply a group of individual believers. It matters that you are a church, a community, a congregation, the body of Christ. And our most important job is to love the world, those who come to us and those just out outside our doors whom the world has left behind. It matters that you are a church. It matters that this congregation has a mission and a vision. It matters that there are relationships and fellowship forged in these walls. It matters that you have been called not just as a solitary disciple, but as a collective body in every sense of the word the book of Acts intends in order to witness together to the presence of Christ in our world. Friends, we don't know what Matthias thought or felt having been the one to receive the winning flip of the coin, or whether his first instinct was to say no to the first ever nominating committee. All we know 
is that he was added to the 11 apostles, and we never hear from him again. But somewhere inside of him, there must have been a voice that occasionally might sound a little bit like ours as well that said, Here I am, Lord. Use even me, because we are better together. And that's everything we know about the first ever church business meeting. Amen.